From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Call it the coup that wasn't or the rebellion that failed, but the 24-hour revolt and then retreat by Yevgeny Prigozhin in Russia against Vladimir Putin's government was a stunning event that raises doubts about Putin's hold on power and the future of the prosecution of the Ukraine war. Prigozhin's Wagner group of mercenaries took control of a couple of southern Russian cities that embarked on the road to Moscow. There were some skirmishes with the Russian military before Prigozhin orders his troops to turn back. Prigozhin then cut a deal, or so it is said, supposedly negotiated by Belarus dictator and Putin ally Alexander Lukashenko, so that Prigozhin would leave Russia for exile in Belarus in return for amnesty for himself and his troops. An amazing set of events to discuss. And I'm here with a couple of my esteemed columnists and colleagues, uh, Holman Jenkins and uh, Kim Strassel. Welcome to you both. Holman, you often write about Putin and Russia. Why do you think Prigozhin did this? Well, you know, he just released a new audio message just in the last hour or so in which he says it wasn't a coup attempt. It was a demonstration, kind of an Occupy Moscow kind of demonstration that was partly aimed at showing how an army can move when it is well organized and well run in contrast to the Russian military against which he has been waging an internal war for the last five or six months. And he also wanted to uh, call attention to the failures of the military leadership to support Wagner specifically, but it wasn't an attempted coup, he is now saying. He's now saying, yeah, and of course he has been at the uh in a public war with Sergei Shoigu, the defense minister and the chairman of the uh, Russian Joint Chiefs of Staff, Valery Gerasimov, saying they're incompetent. And if what Prigozhin is saying now is true, then what he was trying to do was have a kind of dramatic show event that would get Putin's attention. And so he would sack those two guys and put the more competent people in charge of the war, maybe including Prigozhin. To short circuit the Ministry of Defense, a Shoigu's attempt to roll up Wagner and incorporate it in the Russian military and put Prigozhin himself out to pasture as a rival. Prigozhin also specifically said that his goal was to stop the attempt to uh, extinguish Wagner. So the mercenary army that Putin allowed Prigozhin to create was going to be put in control of the military, perhaps because he had become so outspoken and was deemed to be a threat. As often in dictatorships, these kinds of mercenary armies and forces often become a threat to the regime. But there was no doubt if Putin had deployed the Russian Air Force against the Wagner Group on the road to Moscow, they could have destroyed it, I assume. That was also must be part of Bogosian's calculation to retreat. He didn't have the forces, or it didn't appear anyway, that he had the support elsewhere in the Russian military or indeed in the Russian government to actually stage a coup. Well, he now claims his intention was never to fight. And it was terribly regrettable that on the parade to Moscow, he had to shoot down some Russian military helicopters <laughs> and apparently a transport plane. And that it was the realization that there was going to be bloodshed that caused him to stop what was just this demonstration project. That's what he's saying now. And what do you think? Are you buying it? You know, I think he was winging it. He was wanted to see what was going to happen. He clearly expected more of the Russian military to join him or at least step out of his way because they are sympathetic to his critique. And he made that clear again today that lots of people were lining up with him. In fact, some of the people who were killed in his convoy, he says, were not Wagner people, but were Russian military conscripts who had joined them. So I think he definitely was hoping that he would get a better reaction from the military and that they would basically line up behind him and make it clear that Shoigo and Gerasimov had to go. Kim, if that was indeed Prigozhin's calculation, it was a miscalculation because Putin, of course, came out strongly on Saturday and denounced this as a treason and as an attempt at a regime change and compared it to 1917 and now has basically said that Prigozhin was an enemy of the state. Putin has remained silent since then. And meantime, there is the Belarusian intervention where Lukashenko allegedly has negotiated this deal where Prigozhin will be in exile in Belarus. I have to say that's a chancy uh, exercise for Pogosian because people who are targeted by Putin tend to have a short shelf life. What do you make of the Belarusian 
angle here? Well, first of all, just on your first point, I mean, this is the big question that nobody really knows yet, was whether or not Prigozhin was coordinating with factions inside of the vast security apparatus or within the Kremlin. People have looked, for instance, at the fact that he faced very little resistance as he rolled in to Rostov on Don, and the fact that the Rostov National Guard did nothing. Was that because they were initially allied with him and maybe there were some people high up that saw this and then changed their minds in the end to whether or not they were going to help him? Uh, it's just, it's unclear. Or did they simply not have the means to stop him at least in that area of the country. And we may never know the answer to that. But I agree with you, Paul, the the Lukashenko deal, it allowed everything to be calmed down. But uh, we don't know where Prigozhin necessarily is, as Holman says he's put out this message. But Wagner has a lot of different options, too, other than Belarus. They have a base out in a different part of Russia. There's a question about whether or not some are hunkered down there in Malkino. They also have operations operations in Africa, in Syria. He could potentially go to other places. The Russian security services paraded around yesterday that they'd raided one of his hotels and showed his many passports and that they'd taken $48 million. Um, You have to imagine he has other stashes elsewhere. And if he may even indeed be using the airfields in southern Russia at the moment to get his people out, that would probably be wise. One of the interesting things here is supposedly those who took part in this are going to get amnesty. If I were any of those people, I wouldn't bet on getting that in the end in the wake of this. Putin's tolerance for any kind of revolt or dissidence is going to shrink even further. And if they don't get hanged now, they will sometime in the future. And if I were Prigozhin, I wouldn't think that there is any safe passage in Belarus whatsoever. But, you know, to me, what this shows is Putin, he manages himself by dividing and conquering all these rival security services and now mercenary groups. And I think the big question here is that this has shown that he seems to be no longer capable of managing those rivalries. And it's broken out into the open over the last six months. And just because this has been put down, I wouldn't necessarily view that as an end to the threat to his reign at the moment. The Russian military demonstration of amnesty might be expressed as an extended tour of the front lines on the uh, battle with Ukraine and the counteroffensive. So I agree with you on their prospects. On the point about uh, Putin and uh, support, let's listen to Secretary of State Antony Blinken this weekend on uh, ABC's This Week talking about Putin. 16 months ago, Putin was uh, on the doorstep of of Kyiv in Ukraine, looking to take the city in a matter of days, erase the country from the map. Now he's had to defend Moscow, Russia's capital, against a mercenary of his own making. So I think this is clearly, uh, we see cracks uh, emerging, where they go, if if anywhere. Uh, When they get there, very hard to say. I don't want to speculate on it, uh, but I don't think we've seen the final act. Holman, this is the big question, is what are the cracks in support for Putin behind the scenes among the elites? What is it, the phrase in Russian, the Siloviki? This war in Ukraine has been a debacle in many ways for them, for the Russian economy, for the Russian military. We don't know to what extent the support for Putin has changed. It's hard to know. It's the cracks between the regime sub-gangs, if you want to call it that, that are the real issue here. As long as they can't agree on a replacement, they are kind of stuck with Putin. And that's the game he's been playing. He plays it increasingly passively and in a foot dragging way. In fact, this whole Prigozhin thing is kind of a dramatic example of that. His unwillingness for month after month to intervene and resolve the dispute between the Ministry of Defense and Prigozhin, two of his power centers. He likes to have them against each other. But he also, he's been remarkably unwilling to put any of his underlings out to pasture if they fail him, as long as they are personally loyal. Like he keeps finding new jobs for them and papering over disputes. I don't know if he can paper over this one. That'll be the interesting question, as Kim pointed out, whether Prigozhin is brought back in as kind of some loyal 
member of the regime in some fashion or whether he really is on the outside and has to watch out for someone coming after him. I think for the war, though, it might be more problematic than uh, our secretary of state lets on, because I think a weaker Putin has an even harder time uh, coming to negotiations and a resolution. On the other hand, I think it strengthens Shoigu and Gerasimov next time Putin wants some crazy uh, dream offensive that he thinks is going to solve the problem. It's going to make it easier for them to say no, and we have to stay on the defensive, which I think is where the Russian military really is coming from now. Thank you.